So I'm just going to do a little bit of an intro. So who is here for the first time? Raise your hand. There you go. That is awesome. There you go. Um, so thank you for walking into a room that uh, is a little nerve wracking sometime when you go in and you don't know a whole bunch of people. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of uh, kind of background of the wise and wonderful women. So about three years ago, uh, I had moved into this building and my kids were going off to college and I was really, I used to advertising, my, I, I am a real estate broker and advertised in the, in the New York City taxis. And so I decided that it would be hysterical to advertise looking for a man because it is incredibly difficult to find a single divorced dad to remarry. And then, so anyway, so I, um, and, and everybody thought I was nuts to do it. They wouldn't, they, so anyway, I put it into the taxis and it went viral and about 15 million people saw it. And out of that in New York City, a Trump supporter, an 82-year-old and a 22-year-old, and that is it in New York City, okay? In terms of single guys. Now, if I, if I, yeah, exactly, exactly. And the rest is history, and I'm very, very happy now. We're very happy. So anyway, so, but in the taxi ad, I originally filmed it, and I just said, I'm looking for a single divorce, dad, dad to remarry, he was, you know, whatever. But I ended up saying, that if you can appreciate the fit and fabulous 57-year-old woman, feel free to give me a call. And so it has not stopped that people will come up to me and say, you were, well, first of all, did it work, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm still looking, it's okay, it's all good. I've got Bonnie Winston on my side. Bonnie Winston, fantastic matchmaker, yes. she's right in the house. <laughs> she's got my right. number. <laughs> exactly. But, um, but they, they said you were so brave. And I said, well, why was I so brave? And they said, I said, because I was looking for love. And they said, and I said, because I said I was 57. And they said, yeah. So I said, that has got to stop. That is crazy because so many people were saying, I feel invisible. I feel like just not seen anymore. And that's why your book resonated with me so much. And that's why it resonates with everybody in here. I didn't even send out an invitation to this event. It was just kind of word of mouth. And everybody wanted to come and see you. So um, anyway, um, how I feel about you. So, so the wise and wonderful women was born. So anyway, um, when you leave, there are bios on there that says where you live. When you leave, the best way to leave is on 30th Street, um, and you can go out there and call an Uber. I'll give you the address. But share a cab because usually we're sitting at tables. It's a different format because we had so many people that wanted to come. But share a cab, ask somebody out the next day because I'm sure that you will say that your women friends were, I think you meant, you said your anchor, right? My anchor. And making those women friends and growing those relationships are super important. So that is what we are all about. So um, I wanted to just start with an o the opening of your book by Maria Shriver. Um, and I loved it because she shares the missions of her books um, and describes what I hope that I can give to all of you, which is um, you know, through the speaker series and through the Wise and Wonderful Women. And it's, uh, the company is called, I guess the publishing company is under? It's under, under the umbrella of Penguin Random House, right. but her company is the Open Fields. Open Fields, yes. okay. So she starts with this and it was just, I loved it and I wanted to read it to you. We are all seeking the same things. We're all seeking dignity. We're all seeking joy. We're all seeking love and acceptance, seeking to be seen and to be safe. There's no competition for these things that we seek because they are not material goods. They are spiritual gifts. We can all give these other gifts to each other if we share what we know, what has lifted us up, what has moved us forward. That is our duty to one another, to help each other towards acceptance, towards peace, towards happiness. And my promise to you is that the books published under this imprint will be maps to the open field, written by guides who know the path and who want to share it. Each title will offer insights, inspiration, and guidance for moving beyond the fears, judgments, and the masks that we all wear. And when we take off those masks, guess what? We all see that we are the opposite of what we thought, that we are each other, and that we're on our way to the open field 
we are all helping one another along the path. I'll meet you there. With love, Maria Shriver. And it, and it is with that incredible gratitude that I welcome Paulina Portskova. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, I, um, so how did this beautiful book, because it's beautifully written, you're an incredibly gifted writer, how did it come to be? Um, okay, well, so it came, up, came to be, and, and, and it's, it's great that you read Maria, Maria's letter and Maria's intent, because I was, um, and this is, let's see, okay, we're in 2023, just, right? <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Things go a little weird when you're a certain age. Uh, so 2022, 2021. In August of 2021, um, I was, I had just rented an apartment in New York, and I still am sort of the widow that doesn't know what the hell is going on in my life and where I'm going to go and what I'm going to do. Um, and I get a Marie call from Maria Shriver. Now, I Doesn't happen every day. No, <laughs> I don't know Maria Shriver. I've never met her, and I'm so Aren't all famous people friends? Yeah, right, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe they are, but they left me out. I don't know. Um, but she calls me, and I'm like, it's Maria Shriver, you know. Um, can't imagine why she's calling me. And so I'm like kind of excited to speak to this, you know, uh, mythical Maria Shriver. And she, of course, of course, she's like the most down to earth and wonderful woman. But she, she just got on the phone with me and she said, look, I follow you on Instagram and I love what you're doing. And I'm starting an imprint in which I really want to contribute something good to the world, the way she was saying. And I would like you to be my third book. And I'm like, nice. <laughs> okay. And how do I do that? And it's like, well, you know, and she said, because she has a book out that's called I've Been Thinking. And it's kind of like a, it's called the devotionals. It's not essays. It's like little short stories of, of gratitude and like looking at your life in, in small, like little encapsulated pictures. And I think that that's what she wanted me to do, having seen my Instagram. Right. Um, and I completely misunderstood the task. Uh, <laughs> Which apparently I sometimes <laughs> do. And I delivered these kind of like fairly heavy essays <laughs> instead. Um, but they're so beautifully woven together. Like it didn't seem like a, like it just, it just was your story, but it was just had a common thread. Well, what was wonderful is that she, I had gotten, you know, like maybe three or four agents that contacted me uh, and said, you know, we want the dirt. Like, you know, you could make a million dollars if you sell like your real story. And I was like, yeah, that's not gonna, that's not gonna, <laughs> that's not gonna go. I'm not that kind of a person. Um, and then Maria comes and she's like, no, I just want you to do what you do, but I want you to do, and I wanted you to do it in a small sort of gentle style because I had read her book, so I knew what she was talking about. And I thought, and it inspired me because I thought, oh, she doesn't want me to give away information. She doesn't want me to reveal dirt. She doesn't want me to cast blame, and she doesn't, she just wants a, 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 a kindness, you know, the kindness that I'm growing to inhabit, and I wasn't quite there yet. <laughs> um, but it's just that when she, and then she, then I went to Panama to do a reality, TV reality show <laughs> in which I didn't get any food for two weeks, and there was um, <laughs> crazy physical challenges you know, where my competitors are like Ray Lewis, the football player. <laughs> it's like 56 year old woman versus a professional football <laughs> player. That's an even field, I, I get that. Um, it was actually really fun, but it completely wrecked my hips that had a little bit of arthritis in them before, and now they have a lot of arthritis in them, so. If anybody has any arthritis issues, do hello. not go to Panama in a reality show. <laughs> do Check. not, do not go on Survivor. It's a bad idea. Um, but so when I came back, and Maria got back to me, she said, "Yes, the Penguin Random uh, loved the, the the two very heavy essays I gave them. Um, they're ready to purchase. Can you please have it done by March?" We spoke on November 29th. So I was like, so I have three months to do this. My novel that I wrote about 15 years ago took me five years. I was like, okay. 
I'm up for the challenge. That's good. I'm a little smarter these days, so like you know, maybe maybe. I know, but it was a challenge, and I just cannot. I still to this day, I don't know if that's like good or bad that I can't turn down a challenge. Um, I just I, I will. But that comes with age, though, doesn't it? That I still have to do the challenges. Well, is it just not? Caring as much if you oh, fail? No, no, no I, I want to win. <laughs> no, you want to win, but that's what I'm saying. But, but you want to win and that the competition is there. But oftentimes people don't try something because they're afraid of, oh. of failure. Oh. So they don't, they don't, you want to win, but you're afraid you won't and you'll look silly or okay. it'll be the yeah, end of the world. Yeah, that's never been. Never, because so, no, you always no. win. <laughs> no, I've lost, but I will always pretend that way. Exactly. In your own mind. I'll do the moral mind. thing. I'm like, well, so perhaps I didn't win, you know, the <laughs> prize, but I won the for enthusiasm. Yes, or you know, or like making the most friends, you know. Exactly. Like, there's, there's other ways to win, right? So, um, so I, you were you were saying that Maria loved what you were doing on Instagram, and I loved the part in the book where you were saying that. A 30-year-old woman came running up to you. Oh, that's, so that's what starts the book. It's the crying yeah. lady of Instagram. <laughs> that's what the, I don't know, like some, I met a few of you that said you follow me on IG, and hello, friends. <laughs> <laughs> like, I seriously feel like, you know, the longer you've been with me, you, you were there for a part of, like, holding me up so I didn't drown, and so thank you. Um, but you said you ha didn't feel like you had a voice before. I didn't. So as a model, and okay, so like all of this is more in depth in the book. So I'm glad you all have a copy. <laughs> when I, you know, it's it's a, it's a bathroom book. You can read an essay while while on the toilet. <laughs> I do not object. Some of the best reading is done on toilets. I get it. Um, uh, wait, where was I? <laughs> How, in, the crying lady of Instagram. Oh, the crying lady of Instagram. Right. So it starts off with a crying lady of Instagram, in which I'm, I'm sort of talking about how Instagram is what got me this sudden unexpected voice. And as a model, I, okay, so I first, I, I first started as a political refugee when I was three years old. I had nothing to do with this. This was about parents. This was um, media, it, I was sort of just used as a pawn of like the Cold War between the East and the West. And no I, voice. I had no idea of what was going on and why, and I was just sort of shuffled back and forth between these, um, you know, points, and nobody explained to me what was going on. Um, I just remember, and again, this is all in the book, there were, I moved to, we got, we got kicked out of the uh, out of then Czechoslovakia to Sweden when I was nine years old, and I took on my first job because my parents split up and we didn't have much money, and I started selling newspapers. And there were often I would be selling newspaper. I would go from drawer to drawer to sell like the daily newspaper, and my face would be on the cover, saying. Little Paulina is finally happy at last, and there I am, like bedraggled, trying to sell this newspaper to this to these people for like fifty cents. I wasn't at all happy, right. Right. Um, and I remember thinking even back then how how assumptions work, how the perception of of of, of people might not be the actual truth. And I think I, I learned that fairly on in my childhood. And then I was very bullied in school, again, in the book. Um, and then I go from being like having my head dunked in the toilet because I'm a dirty communist to literally maybe three weeks later, I'm in Paris and I get my first modeling job and I'm called beautiful. Now that kind of a 180, it seems like a Cinderella story, right? It seems like delightful well wasn't it what I mean that's what we see in movies that's like kind of the revenge thing you know pretty woman she walks into the store with Richard Gere and everybody's like oh sorry 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 um, but it's not like that in real life in real life it's really really confusing because you I felt like well I look at myself in the mirror and I think well I look exactly like the same girl that was kind of lonely and had panic attacks didn't really know where she belonged 
three weeks ago, and I'm still exactly the same girl in this mirror. And in one mirror, I was ugly, and in the other one, I'm beautiful. So I haven't changed. I'm still exactly the same girl. It's only the perception around me that has changed, and I have nothing to do with it or the lens of how someone's looking at you. Exactly. Right? And so it was a kind of, I think, a good lesson to learn early on in life is that that the way perceived, the way people perceive you, for whatever reason, as a political refugee, as somebody you should feel sorry for, or as somebody you should envy as a model, you know, it has very little to do with the actual me. Right. But I never got to say that until Instagram. So the evils of social media <laughs> suddenly become not so evil if you use them for good. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The, um, the, some of the titles of your essays, I mean, we're going we're gonna to kind of go towards, we've got heartbreak, courage, medicated, grief and betrayal, and real money. So I want to start with real money because many times we've done different talks here and I turn to the women and I say, you must take care of yourself financially. Do not leave it to anybody else. Do not not pay the life insurance on your husband, for instance. Do not, you know, take care of yourself. Have your own money. I say that to my kids. So. And now you can end that with, or you'll end up like Paulina. <laughs> exactly. So just kind of the edited version for those that haven't read the book or don't know. You were married to Rick Ocasek of the Cars for 30. I met my husband when I was 19. And I fell madly head over heels in love with him. Uh, and we got married when I was 24. Uh, he was married when we met. Small fact he neglected to mention for a couple of months. Um, also had children which he also neglected to mention for a couple of months. And very, very oddly, I did not find this um, like a poor start. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> see this as a problem. <laughs> not a problem. <laughs> well, you were 20 years old. <laughs> well, instead of going, wait, our relationship is starting with a bunch of lies, I went, Oh, of course he's lying. He just loves me so much he doesn't want to lose me. Isn't it cute? <laughs> wow. Naivete of youth, right? But um, yes, I went into this marriage uh, with my whole heart. I adored this man. This man provided everything that I ever wanted and needed, which was a, a kind of a safety and, and love and, and a, a somewhat obsessive love. But I made... And had, even if I hadn't made any money whatsoever, and just taking care. You were care, a huge supermodel. You were Paulina. I made a lot of money. I put it all in a family purse. Um, I took care of his children. I took care of then our children. I took care of his parents. You I had took care two, of his you had family. Two, you had two sons. We had two sons together, but he had two sons from one marriage, two sons from another marriage, and then our two sons. He has six boys. He only produced boys. I should have rented him out as a stud farm in life. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere where boys really matter because I could have made some of that money back. Um, anyway, so yes, I, I, with the naivete of youth and the, the, you know, the falling in love and going, you know, prenups, no, why? We will be together forever. Like this will never end. It's a fairy tale romance. And so we had a joint family purse from, from, from the time we, we got married, from the time we were together. And that's where I put all my money and that's where I thought he put all his money. And then when he died, I found out that that's not where he put all his money. He had been sifting off his money into a trust fund that he had set up specially for the children, which is great that he did that. I just wasn't let in on it. And he also, in his last will and testament, wrote, and my wife should have no part of this because she abandoned me, which was a legal claim 
abandonment, when you cite that in the will, it actually means it's a legal claim. It's not like <laughs> she fucked me over. Like that's that's not what it says. It yeah. says she was not available for a year. We couldn't find her. She moved somewhere else. I li we still lived together the entire right. time. And I was and taking care of him as he was sick. You brought him cookies the night before he died. Well, yeah, I was taking care of him after his surgery because that's, of course, what I would do to, for a man that I loved. Um, so it was, it was kind of a blatant lie. And that, more than anything, really destroyed me when uh, after his death that he lied, that he put this out into the world to make me, to humiliate me somehow. Yeah. And then of course the second thing was like, and, and oh shit, now I also have no money, which is a hyperbolic statement because I did, still being married, I did inherit our houses and I did inherit our pension plans. Right. Problem but is you, you have to sell a house before you have any money. And they had mortgages on them. And we had large mortgages on both houses. And one of uh, and then COVID came by. So try to sell property while everybody <laughs> in New York's dying. You could have called me. <laughs> <laughs> Cause Annie gets it done. <laughs> Why did I not know you? Oh, that's right. I sold. Yes, I sold her house on COVID. Oh, wait, and that, that, that two COVID sales right there. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. You're making me feel so much better. <laughs> the um, it sounded like that you didn't want to rock the boat in your marriage often, like that it was just kind of to keep the calm, and and the peace. Like you, you said at one point that you ma made bad choices for good reasons. Yeah. Um, and that, and, and it was, uh, there, was a, there was a part in the book, and I don't know if you remember, you probably talked I hope. about this a bit, um, but you were talking about being the, that there was a new mother that was talking about how her CEO dad and her stay-at-home oh, mom. That's my sister-in-law, yeah. Okay. So can you just tell, like, because that yeah, was so, so we, fascinating So we me. had this discussion. Um, at a table, you know, had a couple of, you know, bottles, no, a couple of glasses you, of you wine. You were basically, you had a huge, like, Estee Lauder contract, but basically focusing on your husband and you raising your children, and that was really, like, your your worth as a earner was really kind of poo-pooed. Yeah, like, I, I, so I was earning, obviously, a, a lot of money as the Estee Lauder woman and all of that, but once we had children, and I... And I decided, that, well, I was going to be, you know, I was going to stay at home and mostly take care of the children. And I would do like maybe a movie or, or something like, it, you know, in the, in the year for like maybe a couple of weeks. So it wouldn't take me away too far from my right. children. And also, you know, my stepchildren. I mean, there's a lot of people to take care of. It was an extensive family. Right. Um, and so, uh, uh, and I think I had just actually maybe been, been considering like whether I could go and take this movie that would take me on a movie shoot for two weeks. And my husband was like, two weeks is an awfully long time, you know? And I thought out of a year, really? Because you take a lot more than two weeks, but okay. Um, and so I'm talking to my sister-in-law who just had a baby. And so we're talking about the parenting of it. And, and, and I, I asked her, I said, well, in your family, because she had a very high-powered father who was a CEO of, of, a, of a, like an ad company in, in Australia, and her mother was a stay-at-home mom. And she always, she like loved her parents. She adored them. They were like, oh, it's the best parents in the world. And I, I thought, oh, how wonderful. Like, I, you know, they, they were obviously really great parents because she had such high regard for them. And so I asked her, I was like, when you think back, who do you feel to, you know, had m held more of the responsibility. And of <laughs> course, in my head, like I'm like, the CEO father who has right. no time for his children, <laughs> or the stay-at-home <laughs> mother. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of obvious, right? And she goes, it's about equal. Like, I was like, wait, what? Wait, what? It's about equal? How does that work? Your dad was never home, and then he went drinking, and your mom was always home. So, like, what? And she's like, well, it just felt equal. It just felt like they put in the same amount of, of work or the same amount of care. And I thought, actually, what I first thought was, 
good for her. This is, this is really wonderful. And fuck, why didn't I take more time to do my work? Right. Why did I feel like I need to be shoring up the backbone of the whole family if this is what the kids end up thinking? It was about equal. And then of course, my kids are like around, I think when we had this conversation, my children were about 14 and 18 <laughs> or 13 and oh, 17. Age. <laughs> the best ages. The best. <laughs> But I, I couldn't, I couldn't help myself, and I went up to them a, a day later or so, and I was like, guys, so mommy's just wondering, like, no pressure here or anything. But um, you know, in the context of like your parents, and um, who would you say like put in more work parenting? Uh, of course, remembering all the pediatrician visits that I did where my husband said I have to sleep, you know, because I need my sleep. Um, and all the, you know, plays that I went to by myself because my husband, you know, had to sleep because he's a rock star, so he doesn't get up at like 11. Um, and my children look at me and they go, oh, about equal. <laughs> <laughs> so you said, how many men would be willing to have a job that was only rewarded with emotional gifts? Yeah. So and that's and and we we are content to hold a job that where literally the only the, the literally the only reward is sticky kisses, um, you know, emotional satisfaction of knowing that you sort of did the right thing, providing for your young, and maybe somewhere down the line a vague acknowledgement that you did a good job. Um. Sell that job to your guy. So See what, how would that you, works. what would you do differently in terms of your finances? I would have gotten paid for my time as a mother. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, yes, you should. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you, I was a good mother, so I think I should have been paid, paid a well. lot. Would you have kept your finances separate? I would or have kept, had I would, your, or had had your had some of your own money. I would have had. I would have absolutely put my money aside yeah and like the money that I contributed into the pot that was like the fun money like it didn't matter if it was a million or like a hundred dollars my money was always like that's the money that we use for like unimportant stuff and my husband's whether it was a million or a hundred dollars it was the serious money with which we paid the bills so yeah I would have changed that too I would have would have taken my fun little money and put it away into my fun little account. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, this might this might seem strange, but out of Rick's death, what gifts came? Many, many. Like, like what? Uh, <laughs> That's a your sign. phone ran away. <laughs> um, Okay, so, well, I don't know that I would call it gifts. Um, I, and yes, it's a cliche to call it silver linings, but I think that is kind of what it turns out to be. I think that Rick's death, to a certain extent, freed all of us from a rather heavy hand of control because my husband was a very um, specific man with, who, who needed his control. And, uh, and he was very loving and he was very gentle and he was a lovely, lovely dad to his children. And uh, he didn't have super good boundaries. So I think, um, I think he trapped his children a little bit too closely and in some weird, shitty way, it was a blessing because then the children could actually get independent after his death. And for me, of course, it's like, you know, I had to grow up. I had to, I could no longer be a 19 year old. I actually had to be a woman. I had to grow up really, really quickly. Um, and those growing pains were, to say they were unpleasant is an understatement. And I'm still going through them, to be honest. It's not, it's not like that's done yet. I just posted a, a post today on Instagram that I felt was like very close to what I'm going through right now, which was that I have a, that I have this feeling like I'm a, I'm like a Sharpay puppy 
you know, with a, I have just too much skin. My skin's a little too big for me. <laughs> and I have to keep growing to fill it out. <laughs> and the growing hurts, you know, like growing pains always hurt. But with the knowledge that I will be the bigger and the stronger for it. Are you proud of yourself, uh, proud of yourself so far? Uh, yes, I'm proud of myself. Good. You should be. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The, um, um, so when, so you, so in grieving deeply a marriage that you had for, well, you were together for what, 34 years, right? I mean, married we were, for maybe we were 30 or? together for 35, but we were like husband and wife I mean, for 32. Forever. Yeah. yeah, a life, uh, more than a lifetime. Yeah. So you find out that this, this incredible betrayal by saying that you were abandoned and, but you're grieving also. And um, I was, I was, I kind of empathized so much about you talking about being so angry, but also trying to protect your kids and the memory of your husband. And I think oftentimes whether it's, because when you find out when you're grieving, but also have this horrible stabbing, I mean, it just, it must be, it's de debilitating, right? I mean, just, I think you talk about basically the first year walking around like, I. What I, what I loved was the description of the very worst food poisoning you could ever have, but then people kind of knocking on the door and saying, are you over yet? Yeah. Like, are, are, you, you, done are, you, yet? are you done yet? Can you come out now? Right. And you're like, well, like, right. No. Right, right. That there's some kind of unspoken rule about grief is supposed to last for, you know, X period of time. Yeah. And I think that's not just grief when your mate dies. I think it's grief at, at the loss of anything, of something really significant. I think grief of losing a marriage, um, you know, grief of losing, losing finances. I mean, there's, there, you can mourn a whole lot of things where it turns your life upside down and suddenly you don't get to be the person that, that you were, and that you were comfortable with it, and you were, you were fine with. And it's sort of whoop, whipped out from underneath you and you have to you have to grow another one. You have to grow another self. Um, so it, w and we as a society, I have found, and especially with grief, again, I found not until I, not until I joined the grief club, did I realize what a complete idiot I had been before because of my l lack of empathy to people who were grieving before I knew what grief was. So this is kind of interesting. Um, that there, we are, as a society, we are not very well equipped for grieving. Grieving is kind of left off to, it's like an infectious disease. You, you, if somebody is grieving, you're like, I just want to let you know I'm here. If you need me, I'm going to help. Right. And then sort of uh, move on. And meanwhile, the grieving person um, can't be fixed and they can't be helped. All you can do for somebody who's grieving is, is to keep them company. And of course I had to find that the, the hard way. And in a way, I think when I was writing my book, those were some, were some of my early essays was the grief and the betrayal and the heartbreak because it was still so fresh with me the, that when I was in my deepest grief, people were like, right, so you didn't really like him that much anyway, so um, what, what you doing tomorrow? And I go literally like, uh, it's, it's somebody I spend my whole life with, who I had children with. Like, what makes you think that that's it, that it's okay to be dismissed like this? Right. And does it make you feel better? Because it's sure as hell is not making me right. feel better. Um, and I, when I was writing the book, I sort of wanted people to, people who read it to also get maybe a little bit of understanding for their friends who are grieving and just let them grieve, honor their grief, just sit there and just hold their hands and say, I'm sorry, that's really all you need to do. Did and that's all you should do. Did people that you thought were gonna show up for you not and other people that- That I didn't expect? Right. 
my friends, again, my girlfriends, God bless us. We're like the best <laughs> things in the yep, world. Yep, well, yep, yep. Yep. <laughs> as seasoned women, as I like to call us. That's right. You can say middle like aged, but wine. I say seasoned, <laughs> well seasoned. Um, I think we really show up for each other, and it was my girlfriends that, that were there, the moment that I truly, truly needed them. And then people that I thought that would really have my back were suddenly nowhere to be found. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how we, it does kind of get rid of the, is it called the chaff? Separate the wheat from the chaff? Yeah, yep. it yep. separated the wheat yep. from the chaff, yep. there you go. A colloquial American saying that I just <laughs> <laughs> mastered. So then there was heartbreak because while you were, you were still living with Rick and your boys, you had fallen in love with somebody else. Mm -hmm. This was that your boys knew him. This was not, you know, kind of some this torrid affair on the side. Nope. Everybody uh, knew about but him. But now your husband has died and he's kind of in this like, okay, listen, are you, are you done yet? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> are you done yet? So, so it's let's been <laughs> like two months. Um, right. Want to go on vacation? Right. And then that relationship ended. Yeah, and clearly. Tore, so like your heart is being, I mean, just torn, gone. Yeah. Just, yeah. It was interesting to me too to see how I think my the boyfriend that I had after uh, after my husband after um, uh, splitting up with my husband that I think I sort of like pushed because I was still the same person sort of it was like two different guys but I, I was the same person so I sort of conflagrated the two of them. I put them together. And so when the, the guy, the second guy called, I mean, he walked out on me the day I was, sold my house and was moving out. And that was the good departure date, he thought. It was like, oh, yes, I know we were supposed to move in together, but really, I don't have the fortitude for it, so bye. Um, and, uh, it was a little tricky, in the middle of COVID too. Um, and I thought that's really where the old me ended because it's like he had, he had kind of strung it along a little bit because right. I was still the same woman that I was with my husband that met this man. I was so thirsty for some attention. Like literally, I even said, I turned to my husband at one point, still before my, our marriage was over. And I said, um, you know what, I'm so desperately lonely and so sad in our marriage that anybody that woos me can have me. Like if the yep. Uber driver asks me for my number, yep. he's I'm gonna, in. I'm, I'm yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I'm yeah. in. So, and which also means if you're interested, all you have to do is make a move. And he looked at me, I'm like, okay. And then that was it. He, ne he never he never did anything else. Um, Would you read a little excerpt? Sure. Yes. So this is from Heartbreak. I just loved. There was. I just read as I was going through your book. I just kept wanting to write everything down. Everything. But anyway, there's 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 several. But I do not object. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, the Heartbreak essay was the first one I wrote because I think that was the most the most raw one. Well, it's funny because there's grief, but heartbreak is different. And you were saying that the older that you get, I think the okay, more the heartbreak gets dismissed. Right. How is that possible? Because you think like your puppy love and that person is distraught and you're on the ground and you can't get up. But now when you're older and you're more mature and you go, you know what? Okay, well, you know, next. But well, you're supposed to know better, right? You see your girlfriend comes and she says, Oh my God, I was like really into this guy and then he just like ghosted me six months later and you're like, oh, well, that sucks, you know, he wasn't worth it. It hurts a lot more than that. Right. And we don't, we don't give each other enough time and enough patience and don't listen closely enough to sort of validate each other's grief because it's painful, it's a right. hard place to go. So you're like, you'll be fine. <laughs> I have a, a name of a great dating uh, employee. Right? <laughs> the matchmaker. <laughs> All right. So the passage that uh, Anne marked 
is a specific one at the bottom of this, so I'm going to read this. In both grief and heartbreak, there is only one way forward. Once you start swimming in the right direction and you see the shore ahead, you know how to get there. When you emerge from the water, a new world is waiting to be discovered. You have learned that you can survive turbulent tides. You also understand the strength it takes. You know you can conquer anything from a shallow pool to a stormy ocean. Your world has just grown larger. Your empathy has expanded and you're able to understand that sympathy and advice tossed at people swimming in the turbulent sea of pain are not life drafts. You'll know better than to tell a drowning person to be grateful for water. Amen to that. <laughs> I wish I could repost that on Instagram like every two days. <laughs> the, um, um, what are you most proud of? <sighs> I think what I'm most proud of is like this right now, is, is, is to have had the opportunity to come to an event like this and see these beautiful women that have all come to see me and um, that really is incredibly touching to me that, that thank you. <laughs> we, uh, we, we talked this morning because I was thinking she's exhausted because I looked on Instagram and I looked at your link and I saw things coming up and several of the women that were gonna be here today said, oh, I'm seeing her in a week and I'm seeing her in two days and I'm like, oh my gosh, does this woman ever sleep? This is crazy. Um, and so um, I, I just said, listen, you know, if you want to get here at 710, that's when we start. And you were just so gracious about saying, no, I want to come and I want to hang out with the women. And, and uh, again, kind of the perception of somebody's, you know, kind of that, that you would be not too busy because I think you, you're sharing your, your spirit and your, your kind of essence on Instagram and through that voice that you never thought that you had. We hear it, um, but but it, let's thank you for coming here and and, and and doing what you were doing this morning. Really, um, the, uh, so so fate and choice. Fate is only the framework. It's your continuous choices that determine who you are. Um, so you're kind of handed you know, kind of the deck of cards and it's what you choose to do with them. Um, so you wrote that you have a hard time trusting your gut. Oh God, yes. And that came, well, because you said that basically, you know, when you, when you, you know, you had a, a di very difficult childhood and your anxiety started then. Do you feel as anxious now? I mean, is your anxiety, and is your anxiety, like you were saying, courage takes on a whole new, courage at 53 to, pose nude for Sports Illustrated, but you're saying also to get on the subway sometimes. For it's me, debilitating. it's not courageous to pose naked because that to me, and again, this is like a, 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 this is a way of, you know, this is how we all grow up, right? I grew up in a culture in Scandinavia where right. the, the culture was much different and we were taught that nude bodies are great. You know, get nude as soon as you can. Why not? It's fun. Um, uh, so like, Th that's a muscle memory that I retain. For me, courageous is getting on the subway. <laughs> well, it is New York City. I mean, <laughs> subway in New York City where we will stop in the middle of a tunnel and the lights will go out and somebody will go, <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> is, did they just say we're all gonna die? Because right, like right, that right. wasn't that wasn't like super clear. Um, that really, that, that, that sort of loss of control is what really scares me. But the not trusting your gut, does, I mean, because and you kind of put the two together. Um, yeah, because, well, again, I think somebody that grows up with, it's like, it's a, it's a long conversation. I think if you read the book, it's like, it's a, it, it makes a little more sense, but it's a child that grew up without any sense of, um, of being able to um, control or understand her life. 
And so control became very, very precious to me. I only feel safe if I can control the environment that I'm in. And so when I can't, as in a subway or in a traffic jam, or really any, I mean, you know, even an event like this could trigger it, but it doesn't because I feel all this love <laughs> so that it's okay. <laughs> um, but it's this desire to control your surroundings. And so it makes me afraid in the oddest, silliest places where you wouldn't think that I should be afraid, but you know, throwing myself out of a plane is cool because that's under my control. That's my decision, right. so it's fine. So uh, my, my point of the chapter about courage is that we all have very different uh, perspective on, on the things that frighten us and our courage is born for overcoming the thing that frightened us that nobody else might ever even see. I mean, you might be afraid of cats, of your girlfriend's cat, you know? But like walking over to the house and being like, hey, kitty, kitty, kitty. Um, <laughs> that requires a great deal of courage that will never be celebrated as like, oh my God, she petted the cat. Um, and yet, it's remarkable because it's a really overcoming your fear is a really, whatever the fear is, yes. is courage. Um, you said you like to read palms. So, I would love for you to read my palm, but no. But you were saying, <laughs> you, are you so sure you after what you read? <laughs> no, but you were saying that you have two love lines. Mm. Yes, so in your love line. Well, you, you were saying, I thought, in, maybe I misunderstood. In a love line, in but a love line. Everybody has a love line. And you said one. that you had two. I had two great loves in my life, yes. And you were hoping that that was, that the, sec that that the, the second, second one was the second one, yeah. That the second one has not happened yet. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I'll just that's make another one. <laughs> <laughs> that won't be creepy at all. The, uh, but that's I, how, I, how I read it, maybe I mis, misunderstood it, but it was just hoping that that person that you were with uh, that broke your heart during this horrible time was not that second love. Yes. That, yes. that, that, that knowing and believing that that second love, that second chapter is that still ahead. Is still ahead. Yes. And I hope that for you, and, and I want that for you. you. Know and what? it sounds like, because I was gonna get back to dating later in life and I was dying to know, are you seeing, well, first of all, does Paulina use an app, okay? Who's single here? Am I the only one? Come on. <laughs> okay, so I was saying, I was saying, do you, did you, do you use apps? <laughs> what do you do, like put your headshot? Like, what do I understand? Yeah, I put my headshot no. on, I put Paulina Poriskova on there and then Stop. I get booted off oh, no. because okay. then Hinge <laughs> goes, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, uh, I would like, imagine it's got to be, it, I guess in some ways it's harder, but it's got to be easier for you. But I understand <laughs> you were saying, you were saying like the crazy, horrible stories. I mean, there, you come back and it's a good thing to pick up your girlfriend and, and you know, because your girlfriend's going, so is it like, this is it, right? Because I mean, it's, and, and then you're like, oh my God, like it just, I mean, you know. Yes. I'm so you were, you were saying that recently you, you had probably the worst date. Oh my God, I had a disastrous. But then. I, well, but, but you know, I just have to say, I've had so many disastrous dates um, in the last year that it's, and really, it's, it's, it's really quite funny because whenever I come home to them and I'm like, okay, guys, like I, you know, I talk to my girlfriends, so I'm like, so this is what happened here. <laughs> and everybody's like, you need, to, you need to write a book of just your dates because like, yeah, yeah. Cause like I feel a little bit bad for them because it's not like any one of them is like intentionally awful. Right, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> but they just are. But they just are. They can't help themselves. <laughs> um, but the amount of sort of deceived, deceived random men in their middle age who, um, it, who, who just really haven't figured their way out uh, of, you know, of themselves yet, is it, it's really quite remarkable. And I was just saying to her, the amount of men 
in dates. And I am not kidding when I say 75%, and I've been on a lot of dates. Because <laughs> I figured once I opened that door, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be 58. Uh, yeah. Life can be over in an instant. Uh, I really like sex, okay? So <laughs> just like let's, I'm just going to put that out there. Um, and I, I, God knows how much time I have left. Even though, oh, oh my God, I have to tell this story. This story is really funny. This is like a secret little story. So my mother is taking these uh, European hormone pills. She's a, she's a midwife. And she was a Swedish midwife, and so she knows all about like this kind of stuff. And she's been taking these hormone pills that can only be gotten in Europe and Canada. They're not available in the United States. And she recommended them to me. Um, and so I started taking them because I'm like, I really still want to have a sex life. Uh, past menopause, and um, and I started running low on the pills, which by the way work great. And I said, Mom, I'm starting to run out of the pills. Can you, when next time you go to Europe, can you get me some more? And she's like, Oh, you can have, you can have some of mine because I'm kind of cutting down on on it. I don't, I don't really feel like I need them that much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> FYI, my mother is 77. Love her. <laughs> she got remarried to my Papa Joe about three years ago, right before COVID, in a spectacular wedding in Amalfi, after they had both been in Uganda for two years in the Peace Corps building cancer clinics. So, yeah, this is the kind of a, a badass. mother. That, yeah, a total <laughs> badass. So she goes, oh, you can have mine because I, I, I'm not really using them that often anymore. And I was like, well, just for curiosity's sake, so like, what's not that much anymore? Like, you don't, you, she says, we don't do it that much anymore. So like, what does we don't do it that much anymore mean? And she goes, once a week. <laughs> <laughs> she was swinging from the, she was, she was swinging from the jungle. So she was, yeah. I'm just saying once a week is like, Cutting it low? At 77. <laughs> Love her. Love her. Love her. It should be that way for you. Well, the <laughs> that's, that's what I'm going for. That's where you're going for. Get, double up on those pills. Uh -huh. um, would you, you, the last chapter is every woman is beautiful. And you just, every single word in that chapter was so wonderful. And I wish that you could read the whole thing. But can you just read this? Yeah, it's I think so that's good. my favorite passage, actually. And you said that a lot of women are saying the same thing, and yeah, this, and I, and I truly, truly, truly believe this. I mean, I, I truly, truly believe every word that I've written in this book. So obviously, that's you know, that's who I am. But um, this, this one sort of was making me like cry a little bit when I was writing it. <laughs> so forgive me. Okay, regardless of what I think of my own aging face and body, I look at you, a woman of a certain age, and I think you're beautiful. I love the hooded eyelids. They're sensual and a little sleepy, a little bedroomy, like you've just made love and fallen asleep. And the pleasures of your body, the rumpled cheeks, have imprinted themselves on your eyes. I love the elevenses between your eyebrows. They make you look like a woman of deep thought. A woman who has not let her life go by unnoticed. Your crow's feet, they're the maps of laughter. They're your history of squinting at the sun, smiling at those you love, the most joyous moments of your past. <laughs> I love the lines around your lips. Maybe you were smoking cigarettes late at night in the smoky club. Or maybe you have kissed so many people in life that the kisses have etched their ways onto your lips forever. The lines across your forehead are a reminder of every bit of excitement and delight you've ever witnessed. All the presents you've opened, the open arms you have fallen into, all your moments of the unexpected and the new. The tendons in your neck look like sails that cut and navigate the winds of your life. Just to show. Um, they lead you forward. Your neck looks strong and powerful. It shows the courage and the power of holding your head up 
holding up the history of your life. The crepey soft skin that gathers on your belly and on your legs and your arms. Why not think of it as the rumpled silk sheets on our bed in the morning? It's far more interesting than a smoothly made bed. It has a history of making love. I love the life you have lived, etched in your face and your body, the history of your life written in your skin. And that's why you are beautiful. Why can't I feel the same way about my own face? Why do I need to go and have little dots burned into the skin around my eyes with lasers that heat up and wound my skin so that it needs to rebuild itself a little bit smoother and a little bit thicker? <laughs> well, why can't I resist every new age-defying product on the market? Why can't I, why do I have to do battle with my face in the mirror every day? If only I could feel the same way about my face as I do about yours. <laughs> You said that you felt that, that pretty and attractive was different than beautiful. Yeah, I sort, of, I, I sort of tried to make a point of separating them because I was trying to figure out, you know, having heard this my whole life, having, you know, beautiful, attractive, pretty, cute, and they all have kind of different meanings to me. And I think beautiful is the one that's the most often used to sort of as, as a blanket uh, statement and I think that's all right because beautiful also encompasses the most amount of beauty because beautiful is this and this and this and this and this while pretty gets a little more limited pretty is a little shinier a little smoother and attractive is literally what attracts your attention so it tends to be bright and it tends to be shiny it's it's like, you know, what are those birds called? Uh, the ones that steal like silver, like uh, shiny jewelry? Uh, pearls. No, they're yeah. magpies, magpies, that's it. It's like magpies, you know, m attractive is for magpies because it's like, ooh, shiny, take. And um, I think, and that's, I think what really personifies youth is, is the pretty and the attractive while beauty I'm starting to believe really belongs more to us because it has a depth. Beauty, as you know in art, beauty doesn't always have to please. It's not always pleasant to look at something important that's beautiful. Sometimes it wounds you a little bit. It can even leave a scar. That beauty is important. It's not negligible. And so beauty is a much deeper term that I no longer feel like applying to the glossiness of youth, and I think it belongs more to us. That might be the perfect way to end this. Yeah. <laughs>